Well, good morning. It's good to see you, each of you here this morning. It's always a joy to be here with you uh, in this place each Sunday. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, just a reminder that tonight we will have our um, Sunday school uh, Christmas program here at the church. That will be at 6 p.m., so I want to encourage you to come on out and take part in that. And um, Especially if you're participating in it, please be here. Um, you don't have to listen to me sing. That's one of the blessings of this event. So you can come, partake in it, enjoy uh, the fellowship, enjoy the program. It will be a great time of blessing and rejoicing in the Lord and uh, his coming. And also next Sunday at 6 p.m. will be the Yuma Ministerial Association's Christmas Concert of Praise. That will take place at the Methodist Church next Sunday, 6 p.m. Our Christmas program is here tonight at 6 p.m., so come and take part in that. And then also, if anybody is able to stick around and help, we do need to set up some tables and chairs after the service for Awana for this uh, Wednesday night. So if you're able and can help us set up, uh, I think we need about 15 tables with chairs around them, so that would be great if you can help us out. Um, as Ed said, we have much to be thankful for. I mentioned it last week that there are many things that I'm thankful for, many things <coughs> thankful for each day. One of the things I'm continually thankful for is our worship team here at this church. Um, they're a blessing to us in so many different ways. And I love the song that we just sang, and part of the reason why I love it is because every time I sing it, it forces, it forces me to check my own heart. And it should all of us. It's a song that brings, forces us to oftentimes pause and recalibrate ourselves. And we recognize that we need to be recalibrated because we need to make sure that the words that we are singing when we sing to the Lord are true of our hearts. And so we sing that song, and we sing about the coming of the Lord, and we sing about the church being a bride waiting for her groom. Are we there? Are we there as believers in Christ? Are we waiting for him with hopeful anticipation? Do we actually truly long for the return of Christ? When we, when we say that we want the Lord to return, do we mean it? Or are they just words that we mouth because our desires and love for things of this world and things of this life have eclipsed our love for the Savior and our desire for him? I don't know about you, but every now and then my heart needs to be recalibrated because all of us can find ourselves loving the world and things of the world more than the Savior. And when we love the world more than him, we may say we want him to come, but we really don't because we want more of what the world has for us and less of the Savior. So do you truly want him to come? Because when he comes, he is what you get. He is the prize. He is the joy. Because he is the Lord. And so that's for free. You do with it what you like, but we all need to be recalibrated at times. If you would join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here as your people in this place, Lord. Pray, Father, that the words that we have sung today would be true of our hearts. As we sing the carols of the season, as we, as we proclaim through song your coming again, I pray that we do look forward to it with hopeful anticipation. May our desire for you never be eclipsed by anything. May we love you wholeheartedly, Jesus. And may we faithfully follow you day in and day out. And we thank you, Father, for sending your Son out of your love for us. We don't deserve him. We don't deserve what he's done for us. But out of your love for us, you gave your only begotten Son your one and only Son, to die in our place, to give us life, to give life to those who would trust in him and him alone, believing that he lived, he died, was raised, is seated at your right hand, and is coming again. We thank you for the hope that we have in him and through him. And I pray, Father, for those who have never trusted in Christ, that in this season, in this time, in this place, may this be the day in which they do. May they come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior to know the hope that we have, to know the hope of the season, to know the hope that we have in his coming again. Father, may we look forward to his return, not just today, not just in this season, but every day. And may we be ready for his coming. May we be found faithful. May we be found stewards of what you have for us to do. May we be found 
loving you. I pray that in this time your spirit would give us ears to hear what your word has to say, that you would open our hearts, that you would still our minds, free us from the anxieties and worries of this life and this world around us. May we lay those at your feet, and in this moment, may we just rest in your word. May we rest in the hope. May we rest in the promises that you have made. May we be renewed. May we be, re- be comforted. May we be encouraged. May we take courage in you and go forward faithfully following you in the darkness of this world. God, we love you, we give you thanks, we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name, by your spirit, amen. Everyone likes to receive good news. I don't know anybody who picks up their phone when it rings or looks at a text message with this hope that it will be bad news. If you do, let me know, because I want to connect you with somebody that can help you. Um, nobody likes to receive bad news. We, we like receiving good news. We, we anticipate that when we pick up the phone, when we look at a text message. We like to receive good news. We like it when people call with good reports. We like it when you know, we receive those phone calls of, from a friend or a family member just calling to check in to see how we're doing. We like getting good news. We like to receive those calls from employers that we've applied for jobs in their employment and they call us back saying they have a job offering for us. We like those phone calls. We like to receive those calls from the doctor's office after we've had a battery of tests done. Those calls in which the doctor gives you a bill of clean health and says that the test results were good and you have nothing to worry about. We like to receive those, uh, we, we like to receive that good news like an acceptance letter when you apply for college, that piece of paper that says, we accept you, come to school here. We like to receive good news as individuals. But sometimes we get those calls where the person on the other end of the line, when we pick up the phone, they, we start to talk to them, we start to converse with them, and they say to us, hey, I've got good news and bad news, which do you want first? Those phone calls are a little different. Because in that moment, we have to choose what do we want to hear first, the good or the bad? And just how bad is the bad in comparison to the good? Or how good is the good in comparison to the bad? But sometimes we get those phone calls and the person on the other end of the line doesn't give us a choice. They just tell us, I've got good news and bad news, and here it is. And they give it to us in whatever order they want. The latter half of Zechariah is somewhat like that. It's a mixture of good news and bad news, and good news again. It's kind of intertwined throughout, but the latter half of Zechariah is a compilation of good news and bad news for the people of Israel. Through Zechariah, God gave two oracles to the people of God, to the Israelites, both composed with good news and bad news for the people. And and he didn't ask them how they preferred to hear this news. He just started revealing it to them through the prophet. And as we go throughout these oracles in the end of Zechariah, we see that he did give them good news at first. The enemies of Israel would be judged by God, their Messiah King would come, and Israel would again prosper. But then came the bad news. The enemy, the people, the people would not receive their Messiah. The people would reject him when he comes, and they would endure God's judgment for their rejection of Messiah. However, this bad news was then again followed by good news in the oracles. Good news of a day coming when a remnant of the people of God, a remnant of the people of the Lord would be saved. There would be no more idolatry in the land. Battles waged against the Lord would prove fruitless, and the Lord would reign as king over the earth. Good news, bad news, good news is how the book ends. These closing oracles, though, they looked not to the immediate future of Israel, but they looked ahead to times to come, times and events that the original hearers would not experience in their own lives, but their offspring would experience and generations to come would experience. And some of these events have yet to be fulfilled, while some have been fulfilled to the full. But as we'll see throughout the oracles, there's more to come, far more to come. And we'll see that throughout the coming weeks. But for today, if you will, turn with me to Zechariah chapter 9. Just as, <clears throat> just as we did last week, we're going to look through chapter 9 in sections. We're going to read through it in parts, uh, rather than reading through the whole chapter in one reading. It's, it's a short chapter, but 
to understand it, to flow, to understand the flow and what's being said, it's easier to break it down in portions. So we'll read through the text in sections. The text will be on the screen for you to follow along with, or there's a copy of the scriptures in front of you as well. Zechariah chapter 9, looking at this first oracle from God through Zechariah, we begin reading in verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord against the land of Hadrach. In Damascus is its resting place. For the Lord has an eye on mankind and on all the tribes of Israel and on Hamath also which borders on it. Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. Tyre has built herself a rampart and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like, mud, like the mud of the streets. But behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions and strike down her power on the sea and she shall be devoured by fire. Ashkelon shall see it and be afraid. Gaza too and shall writhe in anguish. Ekron also because its hopes are confounded. The king shall perish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall be uninhabited. A mixed people shall dwell in Ashdod and I will cut off the pride of Philistia. I will take away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. It too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. Then I will encamp at my house as a guard, so that none shall march to and fro. No oppressor shall again march over them, for now I see with my own eyes. And we'll stop there. Like I said, the latter half of Zechariah, from chapter 9 on, consists of two oracles from God to the people of God, given through the prophet Zechariah. <clears throat> and rather than using the word oracle as the ESV does, your Bible may use the word burden in verse 1, or it may use a phrase such as the burden of the word of the Lord. Uh, the difference in the translation is due to the Hebrew text. The Hebrew uses a noun that's derived from a verb, which can literally be translated as burden. But often when the noun is used as it is here in verse 1, it is translated as utterance or to lift up the voice, meaning it is a pronouncement, hence some translators choosing to use the English word oracle instead of burden. Again, that's for free, but it helps explain why some translations refer to these messages as oracles, while other translations refer to them as burdens. Chapters 9 through 11 form the first oracle. Chapters 12 through 14 form the second. And as we read through these oracles, you will likely notice several correlations that can be made between these two oracles that conclude the book. You can, you can see correlations between the oracles and the visions that God gave to Zechariah in the beginning of the book. Dwayne Lindsay, in his commentary and in his observation and study of Zechariah, has noted at least eight significant correlations in which things that God revealed throughout the series of visions that he had given to Zechariah are either reaffirmed or developed even further throughout these last two oracles. So throughout these last few chapters, uh, we see things that were mentioned before and shown to Zechariah through the visions, reaffirmed or expanded upon throughout these oracles. So we'll see them along the way. And as I said, there's good news throughout these messages, but there's also a weight to these messages because not all of the news for the people is good. It's good news mixed with bad news. Not everything that the people were going to hear from the Lord through Zechariah, through these proclamations, was going to be good for them to hear. It, it was good for them to hear, but they weren't going to like what they were going to hear. Some of it was going to be bad news for the people of God. But there's also a weight to these oracles because these pronouncements have a single trajectory. And that is a trajectory towards a specific time that culminates in the anticipated day of the Lord. Everything that we read throughout these two oracles is leading to one specific point in time. The day of the Lord and his coming again. Chapter 9 begins the first oracle. And chapter 9, like I said, consists of good news for the people of God. But bad news for the enemies of the people of God. Notice in verse 1 that this first pronouncement from God begins, The word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach, and Damascus is its resting place. Hadrach, Damascus, and Hamath in verses 2 were all cities in Syria. Damascus itself was uh, the capital city of Aram, and what was being talked about would rest in Damascus. Tyre and Sidon were also old cities of Phoenicia, and they all had something in common. All of these cities had something in common. They were enemies of God and his people. 
being cities in Syria, they were a part, they were part of the Assyrian Empire that had overthrown the Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar, but they had also held Israel in captivity. Tyre and Sidon were sister cities, and during the period of the judges, Sidon was an oppressor of Israel. And just as a quick observation here, it seems that the enemies of Israel that would endure God's judgment that he spoke of here were not just present enemies in Zechariah's day, but these were ancient enemies of old, ancient enemies of Israel that were going to be judged by God for things they had done toward his people. In the ESV translation, the latter half of verse 1 reads, For the Lord has an eye on mankind and all the tribes of Israel. But in your ESV text, you may note that there's a footnoted translation of this verse um, printed in the footnotes. And that footnoted translation of the verse is actually a better rendering or a better understanding of the text itself. And in that footnoted version, it reads, For the eye of mankind, especially of all the tribes of Israel, is toward the Lord. Other translations like the NASB and the Net Bible have a similar uh, rendering of the original text, and it is a better rendering, it is a better translation of the text. Because the divine judgment of the enemies of God, the divine judgment that the people would see by God's hand, was going to capture the attention of the peoples. The people, all of the people, both the enemies of God and the people of God, their attention was going to be captured by what God was going to be doing when he brought judgment on the enemies of Israel. In other words, God's divine judgment would be so well known, it will be so seen, it would be so recognized for what it was, that the people would be paying attention to the Lord because they would know it was coming from him. Tyre in verse 3 Tyre was an island city, an island city with plentiful resources, such as silver and gold. Tom Constable notes that uh, Tyre, in its prime, as an island city, existed with a wall around it that stood 150 feet high. Now, you some think about that. In this time period, this was built by hand, no machines, 150 foot wall, 50 foot high wall around this city. It was a fortified city, and they had been able to ward off countries that would wage war against them time after time after time. In fact, for 13 years, Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian armies tried to seize control of Tyre, and they were unsuccessful in every attempt. For 13 years, they tried to overtake this island city, and they could never do it. Tyre was a fortified city. They had acquired an abundance of wealth through commerce as an island city, and they had put a lot of their trust in their financial resources. But as we look through the text and we look at what God is about to do and what he would be doing, we see in verse 4, Zechariah speaking for God, said, The Lord will strip her of her possessions and strike down her power on the sea, and she shall be devoured by fire. Tyre, they had put their trust and hope in their walls and their resources and everything that they had. They'd been able to defend themselves against anyone and everyone that came against them. But they were no match for God. Everything that Tyre had acquired as a city was going to be taken from her. Everything that they had trusted in was going to be taken and the city was going to be torched. Now, that's not a hopeful picture for Tyre. That's not a hopeful picture for those people. The Lord will strip her of her possessions, will strike down her power on the sea, and the city shall be devoured by fire. Notice these are definitive statements being made by the Lord through Zechariah. These are definitive statements, and these aren't the only definitive statements that God made throughout chapter 9. In fact, throughout chapter 9, there are 16 occurrences where we read the phrase, the Lord will, I will, I have, or I declare. And throughout chapter 9, I have counted at least 36 definitive statements made by God re regarding specific things that he had said he will do. Hadrach, Damascus, Hamath, Tyre, Sidon, all of these cities were going to experience God's judgment. God's divine hand was going to bring judgment upon them. Tyre was going to experience a divine defeat like they had never known. But they wouldn't be the only ones. Look again at verses 5 through 8. 
We see in verses 5 through 8, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and Ashdod were four. These are four of the five principal cities of Philistia, a region west and southwest of Jerusalem along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Ashkelon itself was a seacoast city about 12 miles north of Gaza. Ashdod, Gaza, and Ekron, these were sister cities of Ashkelon. And, and all of these cities posed serious threats to Israel during the period of Judges. Again, looking back to the ancient aspects of these enemies of God, these cities of Philistia would see the destruction of Tyre, and they would be terrified by what they saw. God was going to do to Tyre what some of the most formidable armies could not do. And when he did, what the people of the world could not do to these people, Ashkelon would see what was taking place in the cities of the northern region, and they would be afraid in light of they were seeing because they would know that it was coming for them. What was happening to the cities in, in the north was coming their way, and they would know it. Ekron, uh, <clears throat> Ashkelon would see what was taking place. They would be afraid in light of what they were seeing. Gaza would writhe in anguish. Ekron would be hopeless and afraid. The king of Gaza would perish. Ashkelon would become uninhabited. Foreigners would dwell in Ashdod, and God was going to cut off the pride of Philistia. He was going to bring them to ruin. The idolatrous and pagan practices of the Philistines would, would be removed from the people as well. This reference to God taking away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth was a reference to the, the consumption of idolatrous sacrifices made by the people and the ending of such practices. It was going to be removed from the people so that they couldn't do it anymore. And there would be a remnant of people that would remain in Philistia after God brought his judgment upon these cities. But after this judgment was rendered, the remaining people would be like a clan in Judah. And those remaining in Ekron would be like the Jebusites, or as Dwayne Lindsay notes, they would become absorbed into the population of God's people. Like verses 1 through 4, we here again find ancient enemies of Israel, ancient enemies of God, incurring the judgment of God. And this might be a stretch here, so if you're taking notes, take this one in pencil because I can't be dogmatic about it. But given the ancient aspect of the opposition of these people, one could infer that God does not forget the deeds of his enemies and he will hold them accountable for all that they have done against him and his people. But we can say with full assurance from the scriptures that God does not forget the sins of those who are opposed to him. He does not forget the sins of those who do not belong to him through faith in Jesus Christ, and he will hold them accountable for their sins against him. Looking at the judgment that comes against the enemies of the people of God it should remind us that there is a judgment still to come for those who do not belong to God. And it will be far more devastating than what we read here. It's also interesting to note that God's judgment on Israel's enemies would begin in the north and move to the south. If you look on a map, all of the cities mentioned in verses 1 through 4 are to the north of Jerusalem. All of the cities mentioned in verses 5 through 7 are to the south and southwest of Jerusalem. And it's also worth noting that what we have read in verses 1 through 8 has already been, at the very least, partially fulfilled in the course of history. Because Zechariah's prophetic ministry began in 520 B.C. It lasted for at least a period of two years, if not a little bit longer. And in that time, the Assyrian Empire was strong. Remember, the Assyrians are the ones who came in and kicked Nebuchadnezzar to the curb, overtook them, and became the ruling power of the time. The Assyrian Empire was strong, but all empires come to an end at some point. All empires in this world come to an end at some point. And in 333 BC, Alexander the Great was on a conquest of his own, and he was making his own empire great. And Alexander the Great defeated the Persians, and he was headed toward Egypt. And on his way towards Egypt, cities of Palestine lied in his path. Each of these cities mentioned here in verses 1 through 8. Each of these cities lied in his path, and from north to south, Alexander the Great marched. 
And Alexander the Great and his troops did something that even Nebuchadnezzar and his great armies were not able to do. They destroyed the city of Tyre, and it didn't take them very long to do it. They destroyed the city of Tyre before venturing south, and one by one, the cities mentioned in verses 1 through 7 fell to Alexander the Great. The cities of Philistia along the coast of the Mediterranean were mere speed bumps along the way in his conquest in growing his empire. But there's one city Alexander the Great and his troops did not touch along the way. One city they avoided altogether and did not dare go near. And it's the city of Jerusalem. They went all the way around Jerusalem, conquering everything in their path, but never once went after Jerusalem itself. Look again at verse 8. Then I will encamp at my house as a guard, so that none shall march to and fro. No oppressor shall again march over them, for now I see with my own eyes. Alexander the Great was the means through which God brought his divine judgment on the enemies of Israel, as he had spoken of in verses 1 through 7. But God was also the one who kept Alexander the Great from invading and destroying Jerusalem itself during his conquest of the region. God encamped at his house, which is a reference here to Jerusalem. He guarded the city and the people throughout this time. His people were not oppressed or overtaken by Alexander the Great's armies, but preserved while their enemies faced destruction at his hand. But as we noted moments ago, the events of verses 1 through 8 have only been partially fulfilled. And we say only partially fulfilled because the remnants of the people in Philistia, there's no evidence that they were at any time absorbed into the people of Israel. And since the time of Alexander the Great's conquest of the region, oppressors have come against Israel time and time again. Oppressors of Israel have marched over them. The permanent peace for Israel in verse 8 has not yet been known. So while the first oracle did speak of events to come in the near future, the complete fulfillment of these events is still to come when Messiah will come to dwell with his people in the land and his people will forever be guarded from any and every enemy. Which leads us to verse 9. A verse that is well known. A verse that many of us have read many times, possibly without realizing we've done so. In verse 9 we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The people of Israel had reason to rejoice. Their enemies were going to be dealt with by God, and their king was coming to them, righteous and having salvation. He would be humble and come to them mounted on a donkey, on a colt, to the foal of a donkey. Tom Constable notes that in Judaism, verse 9 is the basis for having a royal expectation of Messiah, whereas Christians see the verse as a prophecy of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. In Matthew 21, 1 through 8, we find that Jesus did fulfill this prophecy as he was presented to the people riding on a donkey as he entered into the city just days before he would be crucified. And while it may seem that the presentation of Jesus was anything but royal, Constable again notes that a donkey's colt was a purebred donkey. A donkey's colt was a purebred donkey. And as Joyce Baldwin notes, a purebred donkey qualified as a royal mount, a ride fitting for a king. So while Jesus' entrance into the city on Palm Sunday was a humble entrance, it was also a royal entrance, a royal entrance fitting for a king. But we also find in the Gospels that Jesus was not the king that Israel was looking for. This is a side note, but Israel was looking for a political king, a warrior king, a Messiah who would come in and overthrow the enemies of Israel, set the people free, and restore them to prominence as his people in the land in that time. That's what they were anticipating. That's what they were looking for. 
when you and I read through the Gospels, I think we have a tendency to look down on the Israelites because of the way in which they responded to Jesus. We, we have a tendency to read the Gospels and we look down upon the Israelites for their unbelief or we look down on them for expecting a warrior king to come for them. But put yourself in the shoes of the Israelites for a moment. Imagine being the descendant of these people that had faced terrible forms of oppression from enemy nations for years. Put yourself in their shoes and read through verses 1 through 8 of this chapter. Read of the judgment that God was going to bring upon the enemies of Israel. Read about the promise of verse 9 and the coming of a king, their king, not just any king, their king. And chances are good, if we were in their place, you and I would expect the same. You and I would expect a warrior king to come, not a humble servant. Chances are good, you and I would have <clears throat> been no different from them. And so I would say that we would do well to be a little more gracious toward the Israelites when reading through the Gospels. Because were it not for the grace of God, you and I would be no different than them, and we would have responded in the same manner. Israel's king, Israel's Messiah was coming to them, but notice the contrast between verse 9 and the previous visions that were given to Zechariah. In the first vision that was given to Zechariah, the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, the pre-incarnate Messiah, was seen riding on a red horse. And we noted throughout our study of the visions that, that in Scripture, horses regularly depict or represent warfare. But here in verse 9, Messiah, the Christ, the King, doesn't come on a horse, but he comes on a donkey. If the ruler of a nation was visiting another nation and they were coming to visit that nation nor coming to visit the ruler of the nation in peace, the ruler of the nation that was traveling would ride a donkey and not a horse. Because again, horses were used in battle, not for general travel. If the ruler of a nation was not coming in peace, they would ride a horse. But if they came in peace, they would ride a donkey. Because to ride a donkey demonstrated their coming in peace. When Jesus came and ministered in the flesh, he did not come to battle. He came in peace. On the Sunday before he would be crucified, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey, symbolizing both his royalty and his coming in peace. But when Jesus comes again, he's not coming in peace. When Jesus comes again, he will not ride on a donkey, but he will ride on a horse. And those who belong to him will be secure and victorious with him, as we see in verses 10 through 17. If you will follow along with me, verses 10 through 17. Again, the oracle continues, and here we read, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I have bent Judah as my bow, I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. The Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will protect them, and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones, and they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine, and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people, for like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness and how great his beauty. Grain shall make the young men flourish and new wine the young women. Warren Wiersbe notes that the entire church age, the period that you and I find ourselves living in right now as believers in Christ, the entire church age fits between verses 9 and 10. And I believe he is absolutely spot on in that observation that he has made. 
Verse 9 was a prophecy of Messiah's coming, which was perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus in his first advent. Verses 10 and following look ahead to events that will come to see their complete fulfillment at the second advent, the second coming of Jesus when he comes again. The chariot, the war horse, the bow in verse 10 are all tools of warfare, and all of these will be cut off by God as there will be no warfare among his people. Because Messiah will speak peace to the nation, he will rule over the people from sea to sea. From the the Euphrates River, which is the river in reference here, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth, nothing is going to be outside of Messiah's governance. And peace will be known throughout the world. Christ has come. But this right here that we read has not yet been known because it won't come until he comes again. Yesterday I read a news article that reported U.S. intelligence shows that Russia is planning an offensive invasion of Ukraine with 175,000 troops sometime early next year. That's what our intelligence shows. On Saturday, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin noted that Chinese military flights near Taiwan look a lot like rehearsals, possibly for a military operation to bring Taiwan under the control of China. Recently, an 81-year-old philanthropist was shot and killed in her Beverly Hills home. Commenting on this, Oprah Winfrey said, the world is upside down. I rarely agree with Oprah on anything, (laughs) but I can agree with her that the world is upside down. But even more so, I would go so far as to say, you ain't seen nothing yet because it's just going to get worse. It's just going to get worse before it gets better. Because peace among the nations will not be known and experienced until Christ comes again. The peace that we read about here in the verses that follow verse 9 will not be known until the second advent of Christ. The coming of Jesus in his first advent is reason for the people of God to rejoice. The coming of Jesus in his second advent gives the people of God even more reasons to rejoice. Verses 11 through 7, another reminder that God is faithful to his covenant promises and his chosen people. I hope that you know that. I hope that you never forget that. God is faithful to his covenant promises and his chosen people. And while it's possible that both the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants are in view here as both covenants were made with blood, I believe there is a greater emphasis on the Abrahamic covenant, which was in the beginning. The Israelites had been prisoners in Babylon, a waterless pit, when this proclamation was given to them. But like we saw last week, God would gather the Israelites in Jerusalem from foreign nations to which he had scattered them. This was a promise to his people. And so the Israelites were prisoners of hope. Prisoners with a confident assurance that God would be faithful to his word. Just as you you and I have a confident assurance in and through Jesus Christ. The Israelites were prisoners of hope, divine deliverance, divine protection, and divine restoration with a double or complete portion was promised to them as his people. But the fullness of this promise will not be realized until the remnant of believing Israelites is gathered in Jerusalem when Christ comes again and establishes his kingdom on this earth. Then his people will experience his complete blessing. Then they will experience his complete protection. Then the fullness of his salvation will be experienced by his people in the millennial kingdom of Christ. And looking at verses 13 through 17, multiple scholars agree that partial fulfillment of these verses was experienced by the people of God during the Maccabean revolts against the Greeks in 2nd century BC. But the complete fulfillment will be seen and experienced in the second coming of Messiah. God will use Israel to come against nations swiftly like lightning and will march forward with them in the whirlwinds. And God's protection is going to be upon them and the death of their enemies will be a sacrifice to him. Dwayne Lindsay notes that that we are seeing here Israel's final conflict and victory when God will bring them into the millennial blessing as his people. Just as a shepherd safely delivers their flock to new pastures, God will safely deliver his people from the enemy around them into his millennial kingdom. 
and the people themselves who will devour and tread down sling stones in verse 15 will become jewels of a crown who will shine on his land as a testimony of his greatness, of his goodness and his grace. And the land in which they will dwell will be bountiful and the people of God will flourish continually. It's a time still to come. A time we wait to see. A time to be enjoyed by his people still. A couple of lessons for you and I from this text today. <coughs> First, the enemies of God and the enemies of his people will be held accountable by God. Some of the nations that experienced God's divine judgment when Alexander the Great and his armies rolled through the land were ancient enemies of God and his people. They had oppressed the Israelites in the past in different ways and at different times throughout the centuries. They had enjoyed great prosperity in the years that followed, and it's possible that these people had begun to believe that they were right and secure in what they were doing and how they were living, given that nothing had happened to them, and given that they had continued to prosper as a people. But God doesn't forget the actions of his enemies and the enemies of his people. And they will be held accountable and the judgment they experienced is a reminder that in his timing, in God's timing, God holds people accountable. And a time is coming when the world itself will be held accountable. A time is coming when the world will be judged. And the question is whether your judgment will have already been dealt with through Jesus on the cross before that time comes. Or will you incur God's divine judgment for your sin against him on that day? Second, Messiah has come, and we look forward to his coming again. Last Sunday was the beginning of the Advent season, the season in the church that precedes Christmas, the season in which we look back to what God has done in the past while looking forward with hopeful anticipation for the one who is coming again. Advent is about looking forward to the return of the Son who has already come and is coming again. When Jesus entered Jerusalem the Sunday before he was crucified riding on a donkey, verse 9 was fulfilled completely. When Jesus entered into the city, he presented himself to the people as Messiah, and he came in peace. Today, you and I, as believers in Christ, we look forward with anticipation to his coming again. Because we know that we will get to enjoy peace in the world as the Prince of Peace reigns over the earth. But for many, there is a fearful anticipation of Jesus' return. Because when he comes again, he's coming to bring judgment for sin. And those who don't belong to God through Jesus Christ are going to endure his holy wrath. And lastly, the passage as a whole is a continual reminder that God's promises are sure and there is security in the Lord. At the beginning, I noted that I counted at least 36 definitive statements God made in chapter 9 alone. All of them. Things that he has said he will do. Things that will come to pass. And some have been fulfilled or partially fulfilled already. And given that we have seen time and time again how God has been faithful to keep his word in the past, we've seen that he has been faithful to keep his word in sending the Messiah we have no reason to doubt whether or not he will continue to keep his word, bringing judgment on the nations while bringing his people into his kingdom. As part of his flock, we have confidence that Jesus, the good shepherd, will faithfully and securely shepherd us throughout our days in this life and lead us into his kingdom forever. Everyone likes to receive good news, but sometimes we get messages that contain both good news and bad news. <coughs> Here in chapter 9, we find good news for the people of God, but bad news for the enemies of God and his people. The people of God will be victorious and secure through their king. The people of God will be victorious and secure through their king, who is Jesus Christ the Lord, enjoying the blessing of his kingdom and his earthly reign. But the enemies of God will not be forgotten. Their deeds will not be overlooked. Their sin will not go unnoticed. Their sin will not go unjudged by God. Jesus Christ has come. The Messiah has come. The King has come. And the King is coming to, again to reign 
in righteousness, and in peace in the land. And those who belong to God through Jesus Christ can look forward to his coming with hopeful anticipation. Because for those who know Jesus, this truly is good news. And hopefully you and I can with confidence and with honesty of heart truly say, come, Lord Jesus, come. And Father, we do pray that we would be prepared for that day, for the time in which your son will come again. We look forward with hopeful anticipation for the restoration and renewal of not just Jerusalem, but the world as a whole. For it to be what it was meant to be from the very beginning, God, we long for that day. But I pray, Father, that our hearts long for Christ more than anything in the here and now. Father, where things of this world have eclipsed our desire for Christ, I pray that those things would be removed from our lives. I pray that we would recognize whether we are delighting ourselves in the world or delighting ourselves in you. May we delight ourselves in the Lord. And may we look forward to his coming with hopeful anticipation knowing that we are safe and secure in and through Christ. Our judgment has been dealt with at the cross. We have hope. We have assurance. We have reason to rejoice every day. Thank you for your son. Thank you for sending your son. And I pray today for those here, those watching online who don't know Christ, may today be the day they see their need to trust in him, believing that he lived, he died, is raised from the dead and is coming again. May they trust in him and come to know the hope that we who have trusted in him have. Thank you, Lord. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name, by your spirit. Amen.